Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of McGill Cares, a webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified Alzheimer care consultant, and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which include Dr. José Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Freed, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. Today's webcast is made possible thanks to the Lindsay Memorial Foundation. Today, we will be learning all about a journey through the diagnosis of dementia. My very special guest is my colleague and friend, the world-renowned neurologist, Dr. Serge Gauthier. Dr. Gauthier is the director of the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Research Unit of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging and professor in the departments of neurology and neurosurgery, psychiatry and medicine at McGill University. He is leading the initiative to produce the next two editions of the World Alzheimer's Reports on the crucial and interrelated topics of diagnosis for 2021 and post-diagnostic support for 2022. I feel exceptionally proud to be part of Dr. Gauthier's team. Dr. Gauthier was appointed to the Order of Canada in 2014 and the Ordre National du Québec in 2017 in recognition of his contributions to advancing our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and dementia and for fostering the development of research networks. Today, Dr. Gauthier will provide a detailed presentation on the signs and symptoms of dementia. He will discuss how to best prepare for the first medical appointment and what to expect, how a diagnosis is made through various tests and what individuals and care partners need to do immediately following a diagnosis of dementia. Welcome to McGill Cares, Dr. Gauthier. Bonjour, Claire. So before we get into the actual journey or steps of diagnosis, let's discuss the signs and symptoms that may indicate to a person or care partner that there is a need for them to see a doctor. Thank you, Claire. Uh, indeed, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, as well as Alzheimer's societies worldwide, are using these 10 warning signs as uh, a help for people who may need to seek medical attention. Just a note of caution that any of these items is not very specific. Uh, it can happen to all of us at times, such as misplacing things. But if you think back, what was I doing? You track back in time and you find things. Uh, changes in mood and behavior during a pandemic year, of course, can be associated with a lot of things besides dementia. So I would just caution people when you see that list, oh my God, I got at least three of them on a given day, yes. That's because you're a human and you're alive. But that, is, that being said, if you have over six months or longer, one or two of these symptoms, especially if it's starting to interfere with your routine at work or at home, and if uh, someone close to you makes a remark, um, maybe it's time to have a checkup with your family doctor first, and then he or she will decide if you need to see a specialist. Okay, so then, uh, okay, so you went through, okay, the, sorry, the warning signs, okay, so, so then now I'm going to ask you about the, um, what type of doctor to see, right? Is that okay to ask you that? Or, because you just said a family doctor, but I, can I ask you, okay, I'm going to form my sentence. Stuart, you're ready? I'm going to ask the next question. Okay, 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 okay. So Dr. Goche, once you know the, the, the individual or a care partner starts noticing the various signs, what type of doctor do they need to see? And if they need to see a specialist, such as a neurologist or a geriatrician, do they need to have a referral? So normally someone with concerns or some the care partner or someone significant in your life being concerned, uh, you see a family doctor first. They're, they are trained for this. They will look for reversible causes, environmental factors. They'll do a basic blood workup. It, then, it, depending on the age of the person, 
you may see a neurologist or a geriatrician, depending also on the type of symptoms. You may even see a psychiatrist, an old age psychiatrist if you're over 65. So there's no universal rule about who you're going to see, but you always start with your family doctor. If you don't have one, you start with a medical group, uh, a group of 10 doctors or so, where at least one of them has a special interest in the diagnosis of dementia. All right, Dr. Gauthier, I'm going to let you take it away and give us your presentation on the journey of diagnosis of dementia. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the basic workup for dementia. It's the same kind of lecture I would give to medical students at McGill or other doctors around the world. What may vary are the techniques available uh, for special tests. They vary depending where you are in the world, but the, the basic history taking, uh, the, the basic workup is the same around the world. So thank you for allowing me to share this. This is the outline. So definition of dementia in a simple way, a practical way, the symptoms across stages, that may be the most interesting part actually of my presentation because Alzheimer's disease is a continuum. It changes over time and uh, some uh, people can, will, will see the doctor later in the course of disease and others very early. The clinical workup is pretty basic. Uh, people are trained to do this in medical school and there are refresher courses during their career. The laboratory, laboratory workup will be of interest perhaps to the audience because there's the basic things we do, all doctors do, but then there's special tests, special scans, and even longer punctures that we do in certain cases. Then there's the difficult issue of uh, what do I think is going on? What do I tell the person with complaints and the family? Disclosure issues, we'll touch on that briefly. And then after the diagnosis, and then we'll have an exchange, the two of us. So a practical definition of dementia would be a decline in intellectual ability. So it's a change from before. The difficulty is if you have someone with Down syndrome, you have a different level to start with. If you have someone who uh, didn't go to school very much, they're an alphabet, it's a different level of difficulties to start with. But for the average person with grade seven education, the, the symptoms are usually similar, such as I'm having memory lapses, not just the odd time like, like everybody, but it's becoming more frequent and it's starting to interfere with my social interactions, etc. As a rule, also for dementia, you need to have memory or something else like it, plus another type of impairment. And the interview will try to bring this out. For instance, if you have memory complaints, then I will ask you for how long, and then I will ask, are you still uh, taking care of your bills? And if you say, well, I miss one or two payments, and I'm lacking a bit of confidence now. So it's a little more than memory. Interfering with social and occupational life is also a bit of a gray zone because if you're a 60 year old still at work versus a 70 year old uh, starting retirement versus an 85 year old, it's not the same kind of uh, active social life. So you have to use the right questions about daily life for the activities of the person at that time in their life. Another difficulty uh, is that many people with Alzheimer, they lack insight, they don't, they're not realize what's happening so much or they find excuses. And it's the care partner that actually has to bring the issues forward and it may upset the person with early dementia. The last very basic fact about dementia is it's often accompanied by the anxiety and depression because the person is still aware of what's happening or it's part of the chemical changes in the brain associated with some of the dementia disorders. So you see simple definition, but already you see some subtle things that are relevant for the history taking and the diagnostic workup. Now, this is a very useful illustration that you can share with friends. And if you're a teacher, share with your students because it summarizes um, the different stages of the disease using the symptoms. So notice that uh, from left to right, you have uh, in somebody who may be 60, 70, 80, um, some irritability, some de 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 decreased interest in social events that they used to attend, uh, or frank depression. And then there is a relatively straight line for cognitive uh, decline, so memory, looking for words, looking for your car. Functional autonomy or activities of daily living is also relatively linear. 
uh, it's um, paying your bills on time, then deciding what to wear, and then uh, how to use the bathroom, etc. There's a continuum. Then there's a second difficulty in behavior, it's called. It's usually an Alzheimer's disease in the middle stage or early severe stage that you have difficulty recognizing your house or your spouse, and uh, you may be up at night. And the last stage uh, is uh, motricity, it's called here. It's uh, Parkinson-like without tremor. So it's muscle stiffness, um, leaning forward and falling. So let's use that basic diagram now to illustrate the various stages of the disease. See the vertical line coming down? So this is someone that could be alone coming to your office um, because uh, they are aware still that they're having difficulty with concentration. It's interfering perhaps with their work or their uh, high level hobbies, such as bridge playing. And they're concerned, especially if they have someone else in their family who had a similar problem. So this is what we call um, mild cognitive impairment. So difficulty with certain tasks, We'll illustrate how we measure the cognition in a minute, uh, but it's not interfering with very important things in their life. Then you have someone who may be coming usually with a daughter or spouse with more symptoms, and it is interfering with daily life, like they, they, got, they got lost with the car in the unfamiliar parts of the city. And now they were told to bring a cell phone with you all the time so you can call if you get lost or someone who used to pay their bills alone, manage uh, even doing their income tax alone, now they can't do that anymore. So there is an impact on daily life. And then moderate stage, in some countries, this is actually where most people see the doctor for the first time with their family. It's when the behaviors start to emerge at this middle stage of the disease, the moderate stage where you have um, difficulty recognizing your house and your spouse and uh, you cannot anymore uh, stay home alone safely. So just to say that uh, the presentation may be quite different depending what stage you're at. And the doctor has to adjust the questions accordingly. So history, history, history is the key to diagnosis of dementia at whatever stage you're at. And the history will be more reliable if you have a family member or care partner or a child or a friend or neighbor, what do you call a reliable informant to really go back into six months, 12 months, how things evolved over time. If the person comes alone, we need to bring them back with someone who knows them. If we cannot find someone, we have to send someone to their house and get more history. Okay, let's say the history is done. It's, it's been done twice, perhaps, with the, someone who knows the person well. Now the physical and neurologic examination can be done by any family doctor. It's basic things to look for uh, high blood pressure, irregular heartbeat listening to the carotids, to look for a bruise, anything to suggest stroke. The neurologic exam is usually basic. It's looking for asymmetry in motor strength, motor reflexes. Uh, it's really more to see if there is an asymmetry of some sort, which would point to maybe small stroke as a cause or a brain tumor or something like that. Normally, someone with mild Alzheimer's disease has a normal physical, normal neurologic examination, unless they have some other a medical condition that has nothing to do with Alzheimer's, such as arthritis, etc. Now, the basic uh, cognitive workup is the mini mental state examination out of 30 points, sometimes called a full steam test, and the famous MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And I thought I would illustrate that test for the audience because it is a very famous test. It was created in Montreal by Dr. Nasreddin, and it was very well validated in multiple languages and multiple cultures. But it was designed for people who are grade seven and above education. And that's one weakness of these cognitive screening tools. If you have a low education, if you live in some uh, distant parts of the country, um, the, the test may not be as reliable, but it's, it's well done. It includes um, drawing lines between numbers and letters, uh, copying a cube, drawing a circle, indicating a certain time on the clock. Then you have to name three animals. Then you repeat five words, and after two, three minutes, you will ask what were the words. Then there's some simple things, repeat numbers, forward, backwards, uh, uh, and the serial sevens, and uh, 
And then the most important part of the test is actually, what were the words I gave you to remember? And if the person is not sure, you give a cue. So one of them was an animal, or one of them was a building. And if you have attention problems rather than Alzheimer, usually you get the word from the cue. It's a simple test that actually works. In France, it's called a five word test. It's been very well validated as well. So sometimes um, some family doctors will use the five word test instead of the MOCA in someone where they're not worried from the history as a screening, basic, very screening test. So the MOCA, if you have 26 or above out of 30, it's considered normal. And if you come back in a year, which is often the case in very mild complaints, you repeat the test. And if it's stable or better, because there's a practice effect, everybody's happy. If it's going down two points over a year, then maybe you need a neurologist or some other person to work it up. Now, blood work. It's the same as you get every year normally with your family doctor. So no surprise here, looking for diabetes and uh, B12 deficiency, thyroid deficiency, etc. The scan of the brain can be very basic, the computer scan without any injection of dye, or the MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, again, without any injection, will give you more information about small strokes than the regular CT. But for what you're looking for, big strokes, tumors, hydrocephalus, a regular CT is quite enough. Under the current Canadian uh, guidelines for practice, you don't have to do a CT scan on everyone over age 65 who has more than two years of symptom and has a normal basic physical exam. You don't have to. But practically speaking, nearly everyone gets a CT scan and more and more an MRI because we're looking at very subtle things. I'll illustrate one of them for the audience. It's the size of the hippocampi. So if you look at this brain, these brains, these are five different people. This is a cut this way, coronal. And uh, you have in the middle, in black, the ventricles. And you have circled in red this small part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain where you process new information. You need this part of the brain to be healthy, to integrate new memory and to, to some degree to retrieve old souvenirs. And what you see illustrated as zero, one, two, three, four is an increased shrinking of this particular structure, the hippocampus. And some researchers in Quebec City and in Paris have designed ways to actually measure the size of this part of the brain with a computer if it's very subtle. So this is the one thing that people look for on the MRI, uh, so-called regional atrophy, shrinkage of certain parts that has to do with Alzheimer's disease or other causes of dementia. The other thing you look for on the MRI are small strokes. They could be in so-called strategic regions. So one small stroke, for instance, in the thalamus can explain a lot of memory difficulties. And the good news is if you prevent more strokes, that person will be stable forever. What other tests do we do? Well, the PET scan, so positron emission tomography is used um, by family doctors, it's allowed in Quebec and specialists around the world with the, the so-called FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. And anybody who had cancer knows what this is. It's a scan you do for the whole body looking for metastasis. For the brain, it's a special camera, but it's the same isotope. And I will show you a picture of what it looks like in a second, but why, why would you do this? So that would be done if it's a young person, younger than 65, because the cause of dementia is quite broader in younger people than it is in older people, or it's someone with atypical symptoms, such as I'm looking for words, but my memory is fine, or I have trouble with my vision, but it's not because of my eyes. So it has to do with the back of the brain. So anything atypical in a relatively young person, normally we do this test. It gives you a map of where the sugar is being used across the brain in resting conditions. So the test is being done in a quiet room. Your eyes are closed. You don't hear any noise. In the resting condition, the glucose should be used equally right, left, front, and back. In some types of dementias, you see less glucose being used in certain parts. And some parts are, have to do with Alzheimer's disease, as I will show now, and Lewy body dementia. So this is what the PET scans look like for glucose. This is a routine test. It's not a fancy test. It's available under Medicare in Quebec, and it's available in most provinces in Canada and the rest of the world. So what you see in red are the hotspots uh, where the glucose is being used at that given time and that person who is in resting conditions. And what you see on the right 
with arrows are parts of the brain where there's less glucose being used. And this is the, this particular pattern that you see here is typical of Alzheimer's disease. But a note of caution, you may have what seems to be a lot of uh, hypometabolism, lots of reduced function on the picture, but the person is actually doing very well. This is a rule for all these tests I'm gonna talk about. You, the brain can compensate. There is resilience in the brain of many people, especially those with high education or those who use their brain a lot. And the picture may look bit terrible, but the person is actually doing very well. So careful, there may be a dissociation between what you see and what the person actually can do. Now, special tests. Lumbar puncture is done more and more because you get a lot of information from the spinal fluid. It's not done on everyone, of course. It's done in people who are younger than 65 or again, atypical symptoms, such as looking for words, progressive aphasia. And we measure different proteins in the spinal fluid. And some of the balance of proteins can be typical of Alzheimer or rule out Alzheimer. I'll show you a nice example of how it's done. So what we are measuring are proteins that leak out of nerve cells and the proteins float in the spinal fluid and we take a sample from the spine and uh, we don't need a lot, about two to three ml and you make that fluid within an hour. So don't worry about it. And what you see are the arrows up and down or the different proteins that we measure. This is done in a commercial lab currently in the States. We will have soon in Canada two officially certified clinical labs to do this, one at McGill and one at the University of British Columbia. And uh, it's not an expensive test and it gives you a biological diagnosis at uh, sometimes very early stage of the dementia. It can also help you rule out Alzheimer and suggest other conditions. Bon, so let's say you've had your first or second visit, you've repeated the MMSC and the MOCA a couple of times, you're, you're, you're okay with the history. So yeah, the doctor has to say, okay, is there clear evidence of cognitive decline? This will be easier answered if you have at least two measurements of cognition, MOCA done twice or MMSC done twice. Does it interfere with daily life? That's the art still of doing the diagnosis because the person at 60 is very different from 80, a man versus a woman. Is there depression? Not so easy. And in doubt, it's better to treat for depression for three months and then reassess the diagnosis before you mention dementia, but they often coexist. Are there other conditions explaining some of the symptoms? So the person may have low B12, so you will give B12 supplements and reassess after three months. The person may have uh, difficulty with their thyroid function, so you need to boost their thyroid supplements and then you reassess after three months. There may be too much water in the brain, that's rare, but if that happens, maybe you need a shunt. You take out some of the pressure from that fluid in the brain, and then you reassess after three to six months. And the other common thing the doctor has to go through, sometimes with the help of a pharmacist, is are there drugs with side effects? Some, some old drugs like Elavil, Amitriptyline, that people used to take for pain or for sleep, are actually very bad for your memory if you take high doses. And uh, the pharmacists have a software that allows to calculate if you add this drug you take for your heart, this drug you take for your stomach, this drug you take for dizziness, all three of them together, you have a high anticholinergic index and then the doctor can make adjustments with, with the pharmacist. And that may help some of the symptoms already. So that's going through the doctor's mind. Now, very quickly, we'll go over the criteria. So if it is early dementia, does it fit better Alzheimer or Parkinson or other kinds of dementias? So Alzheimer's disease is the most common over age 80. Um, the definition you see here is by the book. The two or more areas of cognition could be memory and judgment, memory and orientation, uh, interfering with daily life. Uh, the old definition of 40 to 90 makes no sense because you can have it before 40, especially in familial Alzheimer's, and you can very well have it over 90. And absence of other disease uh, that can explain the symptoms. That's the old definition. Vascular dementia is not common. It used to be maybe 20 years ago, especially in Japan. But because now people take care of their heart, they treat high blood pressure, they, they take blood thinners if they need them, much less big strokes. What we have are small strokes. 
And the criteria you see here, temporal relationship between a stroke and then dementia is very rare. It's more gradual and then overnight change, which may be delirium from an infection, or it could be a small stroke. That's more what we see now, and we call it more mixed dementia, Alzheimer and vascular, rather than vascular dementia, which is quite rare. That is not so rare, dementia with Lewy bodies. It's a combination of Alzheimer and Parkinson features. And these are younger people, 65 to 75, who have um, some parts of the day they're sharp, other parts of the day they're not so sharp, so fluctuations. Visual hallucinations are very common. It's not frightening, it's people, and they come sometimes, they even have an extra seat for them at the table. It's part of your life. And sometimes they also have a bit of muscle rigidity, no falls at the beginning. And they often have uh, wild dreams and they fall out of bed while they're dreaming. It's called so-called REM behavior disorder. And if someone gives them, because of the visual hallucinations, a small dose of uh, neuroleptic, Haldol-like medicines, they freeze for a week. And that's called neuroleptic hypersensitivity. And uh, family doctors are very at ease uh, with this particular type of uh, patient. And they are aware that you should not give um, a tranquil major tranquilizers for the visual hallucinations. And just to be complete, the other one is Parkinson's disease dementia. It's someone who has Parkinson's disease with um, resting tremor and or muscle rigidity for at least two years. And then they have cognitive decline coming in. And I think, Claire, you had an interest in frontotemporal dementia. It's like a separate topic in itself. It's very rare over age 65. It's usually more around age 50. It's familial half the time. So frontotemporal dementia would be quite different in the presentation than what people are used to for Alzheimer. It would be a younger person who would have trouble with judgment, difficulty at work or social interaction, or someone who has progressive aphasia due to frontotemporal dementia. So now that we have all this in our mind, we have the criteria in our mind, Okay, what is this diagnosis now at this time after let's say six months, I've been watching this person. Uh, what do I tell the person and the family? So to make a rule simple, you answer truthfully if the patient asks. If the person asks, look, do I have dementia? You may be able to say, no, you have mild cognitive impairment. It may progress to dementia, but we don't know yet. Or if, you, if it is dementia, because it's a mild, stage of dementia and we can help you. But if it's someone who walks in the office and they're already uh, anxious and they say, don't tell me it's Alzheimer because I will shoot myself. Okay, so it's a different strategy, obviously. You would have probably to treat for depression first or anxiety first. And then over time, these individuals will lose a bit of the anxiety about the disease. Not all of them, but most will. And then if they ask, do I have a dementia? They sort of know it, and then it just confirms. And another way to put it, you're not crazy. You have a neurologic condition, we know what it is, and we can help you. So it's not black or white, but the rule should be tell the truth if people ask directly. The same for cancer. And after the diagnosis, and now we'll have a dialogue, uh, Claire, you and I, because um, there are, as always, to be good news, bad news. Good news, I know what you have. and Bad news, it's not something I can cure, but good news again, I can help you. So education, and we'll discuss how we can help people find information and support and plan ahead. Back to you, Claire. Dr. Gauthier, thank you so much for such an incredibly thorough presentation on the journey. I, I wish that you were my mother's doctor at the time because I'm every time I watch your presentation, I learn so many new things. and. Um, so I'm so happy that we're able to do this presentation today so that so many people could really understand the diagnostic, the diagnostic process. So after the diagnosis, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's not always easy. I mean, when I look at my own personal experience, my mother was in complete, complete denial of her condition, um, getting her into the doctor's office. I had to bring her against her will you know, um, and it was a very, it was a very challenging experience. So as you said, from the very beginning of your presentation, you know, in many cases, the disease impacts people's sense of logical thinking, reasoning, 
So it's very important that they have a care partner, whether that be a family member, friend, but somebody with them, correct? Yes, we need that for the history taking, but also for disclosing the diagnosis. And knowing that there is currently no cure for the disease, you know, um, so the prescription of care after the diagnosis, I mean, you know, I've been advocating for years on the importance of education, right? Becoming as educated as possible about this disease, always being one step ahead, understanding that they're in this stage, what's coming next, right? So talk up to me, talk to us about the role of education. So this has been done um, a bit of a, in a haphazard way. Some doctors will tell you, just go look up the uh, website of the Alzheimer's Society, or the people will say, just uh, go to the Alzheimer's Association or call the CLSC, but we need a more structured prescription of care. And that's something we're working on together at McGill. Mm -hmm. But the, the background to all this is um, anticipating the stages when it's Alzheimer's disease, it's relatively easy because it's relatively predictable in six months, 12 months, what the needs will be. The thing is, you don't want to tell everything to the person with dementia or the care partner all at once. Obviously, it's too much information. And uh, there may be surprises. Some people will actually be very stable for five years, even if there's no cure, because you help. Her, their health in general, There's uh, you, you help the care partner, they retire early, then they have some good time together. You, you may have very long plateaus. And these are good quality time. And uh, it, it's hard to predict. <laughs> what happens sometimes, it's a rapid decline. And uh, this is another thing that some doctors are not always uh, familiar with. It's um, you're stable for a year or two, whatever you do, if you give medications available now, you, most people are stable for one or two years, but if someone declines within the first year, you have to rethink the diagnosis. That's something, it's like a Alzheimer 102 for the doctors. What happens if um, the pattern of the, the presentation is atypical? We talked a bit about that, but what happens if people change in the first year or two? It's not as expected. They're starting to fall. They shouldn't be falling. They become incontinent within one or two years. They shouldn't they're starting to have different symptoms that are atypical. So you, you have to rethink your diagnosis. So that's not something we can go over easily. We'll go into that a bit in the World Alzheimer's Report on Diagnosis, mm -hmm. but this would be a requirement for referral. So depending on the age and the stage, you would may go to a neurologist, a geriatrician, or a geropsychiatrist. Yeah, it's very important that people realize that, like how education plays a role because oftentimes at the beginning of the illness, the person still appears fine. You know, there are some cognitive impairments, but as a disease evolves, it becomes much more physical. It becomes much more the fact that, that the care partners have to have really good communication skills. You know, how to manage the activities of daily living, like the dressing, you know, the assistance with nutrition, assistance with grooming. So, you know, and, and knowing that the majority of people are caring for someone at home, you know, we're, we are now in a time of a pandemic where, you know, support services from the public health care system are, 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 are much more challenged right now. You know, the onus is on the care partner. So you, you really need to educate yourself and understand what's coming next. So let's also talk about the importance of seeking out support services, you know, from whether it's for the person who's being diagnosed or for the family members. Yeah, traditionally, physicians will refer to the CLSC when there's a request from the family. And some families may request um, help a bit early, like they're quite independent as a family, uh, but they just want to know more about what's available. So that's quite legitimate uh, interest from them, but they may not need someone to come to the house every day for, for personal care. It's something that they may need in three or four years. So there's also a right time to ask for the right service. So that's another aspect of the program uh, of education we're putting together that we have to consider and not over flood people with information, especially the first two, three years where they should really be enjoying themselves and traveling and having a good time. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important though, as time goes on, it, that you really need to build a team though. You know, oftentimes a care partner thinks, only I can take care of my husband or only I can take care of my mother. Nobody else can do it. I mean, I made that mistake thinking nobody's gonna take care of my mother the way I can. 
and essentially I ended up suffering a burnout. So I think the sooner you can try to just identify some resources in the community that can assist you, even if it's only going to be two, three years down the road, it's really important to understand what is available out there. So then there are some other decisions that need to be made, I think, sooner than later, which are difficult for family members regarding finances, legal affairs, estate planning. You know, I think finances, because at the beginning, the disease impacts, once again, the person's logical thinking, significant financial errors can be made. So what, what, are, the, what are the administrative affairs that people should get in order? I think uh, all physicians who disclose diagnosis uh, will uh, refer to... Uh, will refer advise the person uh, with dementia to go there see their notary and uh, there's at least two documents that need to be looked after when it's early in the course of disease it's the uh, advanced directives what do you want done later in your life and who can sign for you that's called the mandate the person you trust in france it's called la personne de confiance but in canada that mandataire legal representative it has a lot of actually power. And there's some monitoring of that being done by the court. So what you have as an advanced power of attorney can be activated by court if there's a house to sell or some major financial thing or somebody taking advantage of the person. So that's the mandate. And the other document is uh, the will. So if it's not been updated, maybe you want to look at the person who would be the executor testamentaire, et cetera. Just a note of caution, as soon as the diagnosis of dementia is made, all wills can be contested by someone in the family who's not happy. So that's a debate we have sometimes with the families. Um, the other thing is uh, advanced, so not advanced, uh, a power of attorney at the bank may be useful for day-to-day -day needs. So the person who has one account uh, at the bank may want to share the account sooner rather than later with someone reliable. That mandate was so important to me. I mean, at the very beginning, you know, once my mother received her diagnosis and I had to move her out of her apartment into, you know, an assisted living facility, I was not able to cancel, a, you know, the Bell or Videotron or any type of utility without always showing that mandate. And I, and I learned over time to have that mandate, a copy of it with me at all times, because without it, I, I really didn't have any power. So I think from the very beginning, those that's an important document to get in order. So the last point, because there's so many things people should consider, but I really feel that safety is of paramount importance to the individual who has dementia. Um, you know, what would you recommend with regards to home safety, just very briefly, because they are at risk of falls, and then just your opinion on driving? Uh, so driving actually comes up early in the discussions, because uh, if the person with uh, the mild dementia is still driving, we automatically ask uh, the family, has there been an issue recently, an accident? Or you ask the daughter, would you let grandpa drive with the grandchildren? If they say no, automatically you ask for a road test. So eventually everybody will stop driving with this condition, but you'll be surprised to hear people can drive legally, at least in Quebec, with accompanying adults. Because the difficulty for the first year or two is more directions rather than judgment or stopping when it's urgent. It's more directions. And that can be held by a navigator. As far as the safety at home, you're right. If you see someone who's already in the moderate stage, especially if they live alone, yes, normally you would uh, seek uh, an assessment at home by the CLSC through the social worker or occupational therapist. Because as the disease progresses, a person's mobility does begin to change. And you know, people start to develop that kind of shuffle their vision starts to change. So, you know, very important. I mean, I know that the Alzheimer's Society of Canada on their website has some very good tips on safe proofing the home. But, you know, there's areas of the house that could become dangerous, like the kitchen, the bathroom, stairs, night wandering. So it's very important to become as informed as possible on somebody's safety. Yes, indeed. Again, it depends on the stage where the person is when you make the diagnosis. So thank you so much, Dr. Gauthier. It was truly a privilege and an honor for me today to be able to provide you with this platform to educate so many people. I have no doubt this is going to be a really invaluable resource for so many people. My pleasure. Au revoir. So please join me on Wednesday, April 7th. 
for our next topic, which will be frontal temporal dementia and managing challenging behavior. My guest will be Dr. Simon Ducharme. He's a neuropsychiatrist and a clinician scientist at the Doug Douglas Mental Health University Institute and the Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital. He specializes in FTD and the interface between psychiatric disorders and dementia. This webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. Once again, I would like to sincerely thank the Lindsay Memorial Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a donation to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to send us an email or make some recommendations for topics, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching.